So um, with this video, what I want to do is focus on just uh, on another single chapter, chapter 22 on the significance of metallurgy, um, which I think is a really interesting chapter too, um, in which Ganon discusses this idea of solidification. The solidification process, he says, that we are undergoing right now, in which at the end of a Kali Yuga, um, the, the rain of quantity as it comes in and rains over quality gradually means uh, that the spiritual process becomes concretized and materialized. And so everything is becoming heavier, denser, more weighty at the end of this Kali Yuga, this age that we're entering in right now. And he notes the shift in building substances that have shifted from history, from building primarily in wood, to then replacing that with stone, and then eventually in modernity replacing stone with metal. So things are built uh, with metal now. So he sees this process, though, as a degeneration. It's linked with the declining side of the Kali Yuga, going, going all the way down to uh, the solidification process that he sees uh, going on. And he talks about um, the figure of the smith. The smith is the archetypal and traditional master of metallurgy, of the craft of metallurgy. And indeed, the, the name, according to Mircea Eliade, the name Cain does mean smith, actually. It means smith. Uh, and so it's not an accident that he's the, the builder of the first cities and that he's associated one of his descendants, Tubal Cain, is said to be the first blacksmith. Uh, but it's likely that since Cain's name means smith, that he must have been, the, and he's the builder of the first cities, he must have been a smith also. And he's not the first smith either to be associated with murdering someone. Smiths are figures that I think essentially replace the shaman. Uh, the shaman, if you look at uh, accounts about uh, Eskimo shamans, uh, Campbell used to talk a lot about this. Eskimo shamans are uh, wily figures. Like one of these guys went to war against his whole tribe in order to get a bride for himself. Um, they, you can't trust the shaman. The shaman is a figure who is in possession of miraculous and occult abilities. Uh, he knows how to manipulate the astral plane, and you have to be very careful when you're dealing with the shaman because he might put a curse on you. Uh, you might suddenly find yourself having a run of bad luck because a shaman has put a curse on you. Uh, and sometimes the shaman can be killed. If things go wrong, uh, he's the one who is held responsible for the tribe's relationship with fate, with destiny, with the cosmic, the will of the cosmos. He's in charge of that. So if things go bad uh, for the tribe, they can go bad for the shaman as well. So they, they fear him and revere him at the same time. Uh, so he's set aside in a special category, usually lives in a hut by himself over there. The blacksmith later on, as civilization gets uh, up and running past the tribal stage, uh, generally takes on the same qualities uh, of fear and awe and reverence that is associated, uh, was originally associated with the smith, but that is associated with the shaman, but becomes transferred to the smith as a figure. Uh, so if we look at smiths, um, in mythology, they're usually represented as very dangerous individuals or as characters who are associated with evil. Like I said, Cain is not the first smith to be associated with murder. Uh, Daedalus uh, began his career by murdering his nephew Talus because he was jealous that Talus had figured out how to create the first saw when he was walking along by the seashore and he saw uh, the skeleton of a fish and the, the way the ridged aspect of the spinal column of the fish went reminded him of how that might work as a saw. So he invented the first saw. Daedalus comes in, kills him, and steals the idea. And Daedalus in the Greek myths, is he is undoubtedly a memory that the Greeks stored of the great Minoan architects who built the palace at Knossos. Uh, they had incredible architectural abilities. And uh, they also brought in the Tholos tombs. They were the builders of those, and the Mycenaeans went to go get uh, the Cretans to go and build these Tholos uh, tombs for them. So they were held in, in very high regard and high esteem, uh, their, their craftsmen. So Daedalus is a kind of memory of this. And Daedalus is always associated, he's always associated with some kind of shameful event where they always go to him when they need to get out of a jam because King Minos uh, refuses to sacrifice a white bull that is sent up to him out of the ocean by Poseidon. He won't sacrifice it. It's too beautiful. Um, Poseidon then puts a curse on his wife, Pasiphae, 
who then conceives a lust for, for the bull. And so she goes to Daedalus, and Daedalus makes a contraption, uh, some sort of artificial cow-shaped thing that she manages to fit herself into so that she can then have sex with this bull. And the result of that is the Minotaur, the, the human with the head of a bull. And they call on Daedalus again to hide this product of their shame inside the labyrinth. So he builds a labyrinth for them. And eventually he falls out of favor with King Minos. And he and his son are trapped inside the labyrinth. And he invents flight for them to get out. So he and his son fly away. The son, of course, Icarus flies too high. And the wings melt, uh, are melted by the sun. He falls. But Daedalus makes it to the mainland, and he continues with his career, uh, offending one or another king. I think the king of Sicily goes after him, and uh, eventually Daedalus outsmarts him, uh, has him, while he's taking a bath, he's set up a system of pipes uh, to pour boiling uh, water, or perhaps it's liquid metal, onto him, and thus killing the, the king of Sicily, who has been after him for a long time. So the smith is always associated with these kinds of... Uh, deeds that are very morally questionable. In the Kalivala, the great Finnish national epic, uh, Ilmarinen is the smith there, and he is the brother of Vainamunen. Vainamunen is the poet who sings everything into being. He sings his ship into being. When Vainamunen goes into song, uh, like Orpheus, things form themselves through the power of his song. So he represents the poet. His brother, Ilmarinen, is the dark, shady blacksmith character. And he, uh, Vinamurn wants to be with the, uh, the witch's daughter, the, the witch of the north, Lawi, and he wants to marry the daughter. She's so beautiful, so he convinces his brother to go with him to make for Lawi a device called the Sampo. And the Sampo is basically the mill. Uh, Herta von Dacian talks about this in Hamlet's Mill. Um, it's the mill that grinds down the world ages, that grinds from the, the golden age down to uh, the age of iron. And note too, again, metals are associated with both time and space. With Hesiod, they are associated with the Golden Age, the Silver Age, the Bronze Age, and the Iron Age. So they have a temporal associ association, but they are also associated with the planets. Of course, all the gold is linked with the sun, silver with the moon, copper with Venus, uh, tin with uh, Jupiter, and lead is associated with uh, Saturn and iron for Mars. So they all have cosmic planetary associations. And Ganin... Ganon mentions this in this chapter, that they, the metals are linked with the cosmos. Uh, but Ilmarinen goes and he builds this thing, the Sampo, uh, but it's a struggle for him. Uh, he goes through several iterations at his forge. He's working at his forge, and a crossbow appears, but it wants to kill people, so he has to destroy it. So then he makes uh, another thing in, the, in, in his forge. Uh, it's a ship that is evil that has to be destroyed. So one thing after the next comes out of his forge, it has to be destroyed because it's, it has an evil association, an evil intent. Until finally, during the last three days, he is able to construct this mysterious device called the Sampo. Um, Ilmarinen was the one who created the Dome of Heaven in Finnish myth also. Uh, and so the Sampo becomes the object of, uh, of kind of station. Uh, it's given to Lawi. In some accounts, in other accounts, she steals it, and the brothers go to get it back because it's the mill that represents the pole star, that is linked, uh, according to her to foundation, with the procession of the equinoxes. Um, so in that myth, Ilmarinen uh, is very kind of crafty. And then if we look at their neighbors, the Scandinavians, we have, of course, Veland. Veland the smith in the uh, Eddas, the, especially the great poetic Eddas, that's the great Scandinavian treasure trove of myth. Uh, Veland is the one who uh, the king has him as his blacksmith, and sets him apart on a special island. Uh, usually blacksmiths are in special quarters. Very often they're found outside of cities. Um, they have taboos associated with them. You can't mess with them. You have to be very careful in dealing with them. And so uh, he hamstrings Veland uh, so that he cannot walk. And this motif of lameness um, is also associated with smiths. They're, they're usually physically defective somehow. Very often they're lame, as Hephaestus was, uh, the great Greek smith, uh, whereas uh, Daedalus was the Minoan smith, Hephaestus is the great Greek smith, and he is lame also, as Velan is hamstrung by the king, so he can't leave the island. Uh, but one day the king's sons, he finds them on the island, rummaging around through his stuff, and he murders both of them, uh, cuts off their heads, takes the, the top of the craniums, turns them over, and makes beautiful bowls out of their skulls, 
takes their eyes and polishes them and transforms them into beautiful gems. And he gives these gifts uh, to the king and queen as his little present. Uh, they're horrified, of course, and he invents wings, just as Daedalus did. In this case, he invents wings so that he can fly away from the island. Um, and there's a, So that's a tale of a smith that is uh, quite, uh, you don't mess with that guy. <laughs> You're going to regret it. Um, so the, and then, of course, we have Hephaestus. Hephaestus is uh, always getting into trouble. He's just another smith character who's always getting into trouble. He is born, according to Hesiod, other accounts vary, but according to Hesiod, he is a parthenogenetic birth from Hera uh, in response to Zeus's appropriation of the metaphysical vulva. Uh, that's a term I invented, by the way. The metaphysical vulva um, is the principle of vulvic creativity, which was once sacred, <clears throat> sacred to the goddess and to her cults, but later gets appropriated during the mental consciousness structure by the Greeks as the internal womb inside the male's head that gives birth to all kinds of stuff, cultural creativity and stuff that comes out of the male vulva. Uh, and Athena comes out of uh, this, the head of Zeus. And in response to that, then Hera, in an act of parthenogenesis, uh, creates the first myth, Hephaestus. But he's lame. In some accounts, he's, he's lame from the get-go. And because everyone is physical beauty mattered to the Greeks, he has to go. So she kicks him out of heaven. And he goes plunging to the earth, probably a mythic description of a comet or a bolide of some sort, crashes down onto the island of Lemnos. And in some accounts, that's where he got the, the lame foot, but um, they don't always agree, so there, there's some confusion in there. But on the island of Lemnos, uh, Lemnos had people living there called the Sintians, uh, and the name Sintian means apparently robbers. So already the, and the Sintians were smiths. They were a sort of tribe of smiths, sacred to Hephaestus, and then also we have uh, the Samothracian mysteries with the Kabiri. Uh, the Kabiri seem to be connected also. These were also smith gods that were closely associated with the cult of Hephaestus on that island. Uh, it was a very sacred place and also a place of terrible tragedy too because the Lemnian women had murdered all their husbands. All the husbands were apparently the, the Lemnian women smelled probably like a vaginal order thing, odor type thing, and then repelled them. So they took Thracian women for wives. Um, and the Lemnian women uh, simply then one night massacred all the men on the island, uh, which does tend to indicate that there was very strong goddess and matriarchal traditions on that island associated with the goddess and the blacksmith and Hephaestus. All of that is linked with the cult of Sibylle, who comes across from Asia Minor, the great mother who was worshipped with a stone. And the blacksmith, of course, is the one who has mastery over the stone because the metals were thought by the ancients to be embryos inside of stones. The myth of Arthur uh, drawing the sword from the stone is a coded description of the wizardry of, probably in that case, Merlin. Uh, the one who has the blacksmith is able to draw weapons from the stone because the blacksmith is the one who has the power over the embryos. Uh, inside the womb. The ores are thought to be wombs. Inside them are the embryos of the metals, and he extracts those embryos. And by the way, it's also thought, as Mircea Eliade discusses all this in his wonderful book, The Forge and the Crucible, uh, one of the best books on alchemy uh, ever done, and, and the mythology is associated with the smith, that uh, the metals are analogized to embryos, and they were thought to be slowly ripening toward gold anyway. That's what they, if you just leave them there, it was thought that eventually all the metals would become gold, so they're on the way to becoming gold. They're undergoing various transformations, and the alchemist is a figure who simply uh, gets in there and collapses the temporal window and speeds up the process. Uh, so Hephaestus falls to this island uh, where he may have acquired his limp. He has a deformity. Um, I like the illusion. William Friedkin, by the way, gets this right in the beginning of The Exorcist, where in the opening frames, uh, Father Marin is walking through the blacksmith's colony near Nineveh, the ruins of Nineveh, and uh, he sees a blacksmith. They're all hammering away, and one pauses to take a break and turns to look at him, and one of his eyes is blind. And it's like, that's correct. <laughs> There's always a physical deformity associated with the smith uh, because he's in touch with magical powers that have wounded and damaged him in some fundamental way, but he's overcome it, uh, and he compensates for... Very often, I mean, this was true of shamans too, by the way. Some of the oldest Paleolithic burials are of shaman women who had deformities. What we find in graves associated with the site of Dolmi Vestanice, uh, the grave of a shaman woman, uh, clearly a shaman because of all the accoutrements that are buried with her. 
uh, and she was deformed, and there's another one, a Natufian, a very, a very famous burial in the Middle East of the Natufians, which we discussed last time, uh, who were inventing agriculture. They also had a shaman woman that they buried, uh, and she, she was lame too. She was also deformed. So shamans are very often people um, who can't contribute to the tribe because of a deformity, so they compensate by mastering a relationship to the astral powers, and that's how they become valued and revered. So possibly this notion of the smith always having a deformity may be linked to the fact that the deformity is there to begin with and to make him or herself useful to the tribe has to master a craft or discipline that kind of spooks everyone else out. Uh, the art of the sh shamans and blacksmith are they're kind of spooky. Um, so Hephaestus is associated. He's got a limp, and uh, so does Fallen. You know, Marinin is a very crafty individual. All these smiths are these crafty, creepy individuals uh, that you cannot trust until finally we get the alchemist, and the alchemy was invented at Alexandria by the Greeks, but it persisted and lasted through the Middle Ages, and the alchemist was always the one who had the power, uh, like the smith had, of transmuting base metals into gold, because all the metals contain in them two spiritual principles, metaphysical principles, uh, the yin and yang of alchemy, uh, sulfur and quicksilver. Sulfur has certain coagulating, solidifying, and spiritual properties. Quicksilver has to do with uh, liquefaction processes. And the metals were put through three stages. The negrito, they're melt down. The albedo, where the sulfuric, the sulfuric element is invoked to purify and whiten the metals. And then the rubido is the reddening or the final production of the gold or the philosopher's stone, which is the sort of magic wand of alchemy which enables the alchemist to transmute the base metals into gold. Um, although they say, as Jung quotes, ours is not the common gold. They were talking about spiritual gold. They were trying to liberate spirit from its prison in matter. They had the exact opposite ontology to the Christian world that saw matter as fallen, void, empty, and out of touch with the spirit. Whereas the alchemists saw, uh, with their discipline, they had the exact opposite and hence heretical ontology that the spirit is in all things. It's trapped in there. And so the process is to liberate it and reveal it. James Joyce inherits all of this in Ulysses, which is a great epic in which he is trying to do this, liberate the spirit from the banality of ordinary and everyday life. And he finds the gold in there, and he sees himself as a kind of literary alchemist, uh, James Joyce does. So, um, and then we come down through the ages, and then finally we arrive at the figure of Faust. But the alchemist does not survive the ontological shift that takes place in the 17th century, as we remarked earlier from the ontology of the four elements, which the alchemist depends upon, because the elements can be transmuted into each other, uh, but not with atoms. And so when atomism comes in in the, in the 17th century, that's it for both astrology and alchemy. But the figure of Faust then comes in to replace that. And at first, Faust is negative. Knowledge, as we have seen, and technology is always associated with uh, spooky powers, being, the individual being in touch with uh, morally questionable powers uh, that could really mess you up if you get too close to them. So Faust comes along, and he's negative at first, but with Goethe, he becomes the epitome of Northwestern civilization. He wants to know everything, and he has to make a deal with the devil to go and find out everything that, he could, that, that there is that can possibly be known. He's basically Goethe's alter ego. and so, But he's so emblematic of the spirit of Northwestern civilization that Spengler... Uh, in 1918, when he writes Decline of the West, names the entire civilization after this character, this Faust character who is morphologically homologous to what in ancient cultures would have been the smith or the shaman. And so we have elevated in the Northwest what in other cultures have been regarded uh, as taboo or derided or individuals who are, are, they're like outcasts. They have to be kept separate and away from the society we, though, in the Northwest have elevated that very figure into the emblematic figure of the entire civilization. So we've turned all the taboos against knowledge upside down in this civilization, which is why it now has conquered the earth. Uh, when you change metaphysical presuppositions and axioms, it has effects on the physical world. The physical world responds in accordance with the metaphysical axioms that you presuppose. Um, so uh, this, the idea of the philosophy is, uh, you know, it's, it's a waste of time. You're just dealing with ideas. <laughs> You've forgotten, <laughs> I think, that ideas are what transform the entire planet. 
the entire planet has unfolded now out of the myth of Faust. Um, that's why we have this technology. We're in the global age inaugurated by the Faustian civilization because it simply did not respect all the old taboos regarding knowledge. We've simply liquefied them, melted them down, and gotten them out of the way so that all the flows, as Deleuze and Guattari term them, uh, can be uncoded. Capitalism, they say, is what uncodes all the flows. When, when, when the flows are no longer c coded, they're just let loose, rampant. You can do whatever you want with them. So uh, that's my riff on, uh, on Ganon's chapter here on the significance of metallurgy.